Hi and welcome, Greg Law. I'm really uh, enjoying to have the time with you now to talk about what you're doing. And let's get started with that. Like, just what you're up to currently. How are you? Yeah. Hi. Hi, Jens. Yeah. So uh, I am well, I'm co-founder and CEO of Undo.io, uh, and um, so I've kind of yeah kept pretty busy running uh, running the company. Uh, I don't get to do nearly enough programming anymore, but I do. I do still do some. Um, I like to keep my eye in, and it's kind of it's still my happy place. Um, but yeah, most of the time is uh, you know running the company and sales and and uh, managing people and all that kind of thing. I know the part about running the company and sales. That's... Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, we all go eat. Um, yes. So. What are you doing with C++? When you, are you programming C++ then, or what, what language are you programming when you get to program? Yeah, I, well, actually, I mean, most of the pro I have to say, I have to admit, most most of my programming is in C. Uh, okay. A little bit sometimes C++, uh, some Python, a um, little bit of assembly code. Um, that's always good fun, but probably uh, uh, like you know the, the the majority of it is majority of it is C, um, just because of our product and kind of where it lives, and a lot of it's just Manipulating bits and bytes, and and a, a big chunk of it is we have this JIT binary translation um, uh, that we do. So we're like literally, you know, reading instruction streams and and writing out um, the appropriate opcodes and things like that. Um, and then a bunch of it is sort of essentially kind of interposing layer, intercepting all of the system calls. But that's like the Linux system call level. So you know, again, that's very low level. Um, uh, uh, you know, and interfacing with the OS as well. So you know, it's a lot of a lot of the time we spend kind of um, figuring out basically what the OS, um, uh, what 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 the exact ABI between the user space and the kernel. And we have to intercept, interpose that, and recreate all of it. So yeah, it's very you know, it's very bits and bytes. Um, and then it's you know make oh, you know, get all the all the kind of weirdnesses of things like signals and async I/O and mm -hmm. like you know even you know, one thing we're working on right now is I/O U ring and and all this kind of um, uh, all the kind of complexities and subtleties of of the reality of the of, of the Linux kernel and its kind of interaction yeah. with the with the program P trace and all that kind of business as well. So so um, yeah, it's it's kind of Spend all my life really sort of low level stuff. Um, I did. I did last Christmas was a bit of a just a little side project. I did a, a little thing I called L3 Lightweight Logging Library, and it's just kind of a very very lightweight um, uh, library for where you can log, you know, printf style debugging. Is really, really is the, tar the target here for logging these messages and like I wanted to get it as, as quick as low overhead as it could be and lock free and everything. So it's like a one nanosecond. To do a print, which if you compare to like doing a regular print F call, that's like going to be uh, you know in closer to a hundred nanoseconds. Um, if you're doing this, if you get to do a system call, it's going to be even more. Um, whereas this would do a yeah a lo lo log a message in as little as as one nanosecond. And um, the other nice thing about it is it's lock. As I said, it's lock free, which means uh, so this is the thinking here was really how do you debug race conditions, right? And that's mm -hmm. one of the um, which is actually part of the subject of the the real subject of my of my talk next month. Um, and your race conditions are some of the hardest things to debug because uh, they tend to you know that well one the, the thing obviously it's that non deterministic nature right. So mm -hmm. you know, we've all been there. There's some kind of race, um, you know, some kind of timing dependent problem, and you add. A print statement or something, because that's you know the way most people debug. Or maybe you attach a debugger and you hit a breakpoint, but but you do something like that, even just adding a print statement, and and it causes the race to go away or or to change somehow, right? Or the worst is when it goes away. So so you're trying to kind of zoom in on like what is the problem, where is it, what's the root cause of what I'm seeing, and every time you add a new print statement, the thing kind of moves around or goes away or whatever, and so. Um, uh, the the I wanted to make a, a logging library that was like lock free and super low overhead so that, that you wouldn't have that problem. Because one of the problems if you do it regular 
so it C style printf or a um, C++, you know, C out, or, or even like um, there's some of these, log there's a nice C++ logging library called speedlog, SPD log, but all of these things, they all actually take a lock. They have a mutex around, of course, if multiple threads are, are trying to, you know, output some logging statement at the same time, they contend on, on these locks, and then that causes serialization, and it causes, all, you know, timings and orderings to change, and, um, you know, then it just becomes very, very difficult to, 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 to track these things down. So yeah, I had a bit of fun writing this writing this lightweight logging library over over Christmas and put that up on GitHub and some people are using that. Sounds interesting. But let's return to your talk. Um, I actually find it really interesting that um, this is one of the talks which actually talks about more like tool usage and problem solving instead of talking about C++ features mm. itself. Uh, so I think it's a really of a great value to have it for the audience. Um, and so what should I expect when I come to your talk as an attendee? Uh, yeah, so all of my talks, I like to do um, as few slides as possible. And so, you know, I, I actually, I, the older I get, the less and less I like to use slides. Um, still have some slides, but just to kind of set some concept text and things. Um, and most of it's just demos, right? So it's like, here are these tools that you, you, you may have heard of, probably most people, in my experience, most people have kind of heard of Thread Sanitizer, for example, um, but they've not actually used it and they don't know how to use it and they don't really know what it'll give them. So it's just quick, it's fairly shallow. I want to cover, it's kind of a breadth, kind of broad section of the tools that are available, just to, you know, Thread Sanitizer, mm -hmm. Hellgrind, um, the, uh, uh, Techniques like thread fuzzing um, uh, and uh, and using time travel. And we're gonna and and what you do with what you can just do with just good old fashioned GDB and just um, you know poking in and just saying, hey, here's some stuff that's available. It's not intended to be a tutorial. So no one, if you didn't know, it's not like you know if you didn't know thread sanitizer before. I just keep using thread sanitizer as an example. There's a whole bunch of them. But if you didn't know one of these things before, you're not gonna like. You're not going to be an expert of it by the end of the talk, but you're going to know that it exists and you're going to know kind of what it's for. And you're going to have a sense of like, how am I going to use this thing? So the idea is that then when you need it, you're able to, you know, go and, you know, Google what you need to Google or whatever your favorite search engine is. And uh, you kind of know where to start, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, the other thing I'm going to do So even like, Diving into a tool like sanitizer in an hour would, would be hard, I think. Absolutely right. So it's just, it's not it's not a tutorial. Um, it's a taster, right? A little taster session of these different things. And what I find a lot of it, I I, I find that there's a lot of um, anxiety, right, around these things because they sound kind of magic, and they are kind of magic. But you know, most of these most of these tools are actually well thought through. Uh, and really kind of really quite easy to use. So I think in my own experience, this is going back many, many years now, and I, I heard of this thing called Valgrind when it kind of, you know, I mean, it's probably been out for a few years when I first heard of it, but, but, but a friend told me about this thing and it sounded magical and amazing um, and complicated. And so I kind of thought, well, that sounds, yeah, that sounds cool. I'll definitely look at that sometime soon. And And years went by, literally years went by before I, um, and I just got it. It was always there. Maybe I should take a look, but uh, it's a bit intimidating, right? So I just kept adding printfs and maybe using a bit of you know GDB or something. Until one day, I was completely stuck, and um, I actually had to. So I was trying to debug it, but I was pretty convinced it was a memory problem, um, and I didn't even have the source code for the application that I had to debug. So I was like, huh. Well, I guess I'm just going to have to use Valgrind because I can't think of anything else to do now. And I thought, and it was kind of scary. And I thought, this is going to be hard. And I'm probably going to have to, like, I don't know, I'm probably going to have to, like, recompile my kernel or at least, you know, get these bits of source code and there's, build this thing. And I guess I'm going to have to compile my program differently in some way. And it's probably not going to work. And there's going to be missing dependencies. And, uh, 
And you know what? It just worked, right? And anyone, anyone who's used Valgrind will know this feeling, I think. So it was like literally sudo apt install Valgrind, run Valgrind with the program. Huh, there it is. And it told me what the problem was. It was an uninitialized uh, piece of data. And um, uh, it was, and then it was just like, I just thought, wow, wow, why, why didn't I try that years ago? Like, you know, I can't believe I was, you know, uh, intimidated by by this thing. And so, what I want to try and show people is that you, you don't need to be intimidated. Actually, most of this stuff does work well, and it's not hard. Um, and uh, you know, there's just really no excuse not to be using these things. Yeah, I see one of the tools. I'm not so familiar with uh, Helgrant, which you mm. mentioned. Like, yeah, is that Valgrind or yeah, Valgrind? right, right. So, so, so Valgrind actually is um is a suite. It's a kind of tool framework. Um, okay. And uh, there are multiple tools that live within that Valgrind suite. The standard one is called memcheck. So if you run Valgrind without any arguments at all, by default, what you get is what they call memcheck. And that's the original Valgrind. But then mm -hmm. the authors realized that they've got this, new, they're doing, I mean, actually, some, there are some similarities with the way that Undo works here, but they, they realized that they're they're doing this JIT binary retranslation of the program as it runs. And the original version was, yeah, just to check for memory accesses and, and make sure that, you know, all the memory accesses were legit. Um, and then it didn't take long until people thought, well, we could do other things with this, right? Um, and uh, one of the things we could do is look for race conditions, look for data races. And so, um, yeah, so they kind of re-architected uh, Valgrind so that it was this kind of, base layer, this framework in which you could build these different tools. They make memcheck be kind of the default behavior. And Val and Helgrind is one of those. And yeah, and what it does is to, it looks, because it's instrumenting all of the memory accesses, right? And so what it can do is find where is the, are there any times when the same location in memory is accessed either one, well, where yeah, same location memory is accessed at, without a common set of locks being held. Okay, mm -hmm. and if there is such a time, that's not definitely a race condition, but you should definitely take a look, right? You should, you should, you know, that probably is. Um, and it's a little bit more sophisticated than that. So actually, what it looks for is um, is there multiple accesses where at least one of those accesses is a right. So if you've got like a bunch of threads and they're all reading from the same lo location in memory yeah. and there's no writes happening, you don't need you don't need yeah. any locking. But if at least one of them is writing, then yeah, there really ought to be some common set of locks held every time these threads access this, that, 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 that location, location in memory. And, you know, just like the regular Valgrind memcheck, it just works, right? You just run it on your program and like, it goes slowly because it's doing all this binary retranslation and, and instrumentation and, 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 you know, instrumenting all the memory accesses and things. So it's kind of slow, um, but it just works. And, uh, you know, it'll just tell you, you know, yeah, the, 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 you know, this is definitely, you know, this is somewhere that, that looks likely to be a problem. You can, so this, and then you've got um, thread sanitizer, which is just like a dress sanitizer, it's building on the same framework, doing the same kind of things, but rather than a runtime binary instrumentation, it's, uh, essentially a compiler compile time feature yeah. um and but it basically does the same things and and so um it's just like with uh same kind of trade-offs with the sanitizer and valgrind it's like it's a lot faster but you have to be able to recompile your code um and uh they actually i'll get into a little bit on this in the talk the tool the two sets of Thread sanitizer and Valgrind is kind of a non over, it's an overlapping, they're overlapping sets of features. So they'll tell you certain things slightly differently, but they're kind of the core principle is, is the same. They'll look for things like, they can also look for things like um, if you take locks such that uh, sometimes lock A is taken before lock B is taken, and other times lock B is taken before lock A is taken that's probably deadlock potential right there, right? So it'll kind of flag those up and warn you. With threat sanitizer, at least, you can actually uh, decorate your code to say, well, yeah, I know this is a bit dodgy. You know, these, this, this algorithm is like lock-free 
and I know it's safe, so I'm going to decorate the code to tell threat sanitizer this is this is legit. So so you know you kind of by exclusion do that. So um, uh, yeah, that you know just kind of giving the taste for these tools so you kind of know what to expect and hopefully demystifying them a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know people can actually take advantage of them when they need them. Sounds interesting. Actually, there's one more thing I think we should talk about. Let me scroll up in your talk view a little bit, because Undo is also one of our sponsors. And so let's talk a little bit about what do you do and like, you know, what's um, like the sponsorship? What what are you doing with, with Undo? And yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, so at Undo, uh, we, we have, uh, uh, we, we, make, we make what we call a time traveling debugger, um, and it, it what we do is it looks and feels just like a regular debugger, actually just like GDB. Actually, take, uses GDB as a as a front end. Optionally, it can use other things, um, including like IntelliJ if you're coding in Java or Java type language and Delve if you're coding in Go and, and so so GDB is just like one of the front ends on to undo but but it, that's the kind of the interface that you see but you get this you get this control over time so you get to capture a program execution and then like wind back the tape to any line of code to execute it um, and so you can and you can generate these recordings which you can think of it, and one way to think of it is like you have a core file, but when you have a regular, when you have a core file, that's the complete program state at one point in time. Usually it's the point in time that the program terminated, right? So I've got all my registers, all my memory, I can see everything that happened at the time the program terminated. But it's like that, but, it's, but imagine if you had a separate core file for every single instruction that executed. So my program crashes like a segv, I can just wind back. Well, what was it doing before? What was it doing one instruction ago or a hundred instructions ago? What was it doing, you know, right at the beginning of time? Can I like I can like watch, set a watch point, watch some piece of data and just wind back to the last time that memory was accessed, right? So maybe I maybe I dereference, let's say for example, I dereference a an invalid pointer, right? It's not null, but it's not valid. And uh, so what I what I can do is set a watch point on that pointer. And just wind the clock back until wind the tape back until the most recent time that pointer was updated, and like maybe I have to then well that comes from somewhere else, and I can keep do, keep going that process and go back further and further. But unlike obviously, if you had a core file for every single instruction executed, that would be crazy expensive, right? It would go very very slowly, yeah. and it would take up just you know ridiculous amounts of memory. So clearly, it's not like that. The implementation is very different, and in fact, it's uh, it's very fast. It'll run sometimes like half speed or even better. Um, so there is a slowdown, but much much less slowdown than you would think. It's a slowdown that looks more like a sanitizer slowdown than a Valgrin slowdown, if you like to think of it that way. And um, uh, you know, makes basically even the most difficult bug, whether it's a race condition or memory corruption or whatever. Um, like super easy to, to, to root cause. Um, and people also use it a lot to, just to understand code. So most of our customers have like big code bases, right? Millions and millions of lines of code, kind of spaghetti-like code, um, you know, being worked on by probably thousands of programmers over the years. Um, and just knowing how it all works, maybe I'm not even debugging at all. I'm just trying to understand how does this thing work? How do I, you know, call, how does this internal interface, do I have to call this thing before? How does that get set? Why does, when does that get cleaned up? You know, how does this call, how does this code flow, you know, go between the different components in my system? And how does the data flow between my system? And you can just see all of that stuff, right, right from within the recording. So, um, yeah, so, so we, you know, we, we, uh, we support many of the world's most famous, biggest uh, tech companies to um, just, you know, become, when we, that help the programmers in those companies to become um, as effective as, you know, much more, much more, uh, effective than they would otherwise be. And C++ is a really big market for us, right? Because C++ is, you know, famously very powerful and you can do a lot of stuff in it that you just can't do in other languages. But when it goes wrong, 
you know, it can be pretty painful to figure out why exactly it's gone wrong, right? And it's what, what's that old book, uh, enough rope to shoot yourself in the foot with, right? And, and, and so, you know, so C++ has always been, you know, as I say, we have customers using Java and Go and all kinds of things, but, but C++ has always been uh, very, you know, like the, 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 the most important part of the market for us really, because, you know, that's where you have these giant complex code bases um, often it's uh, mission critical, you know, software. So it's the software that's like, you know, keeping the internet running, or keeping your bank running, all that kind of thing. And, and um, you know, so it has to work. Yeah, and I think also it's like a unique offer for C++. I, I know that there's like some other implementations now for it, but um, you've been one of the first and- Yeah. I definitely see it that like in, in a large code base, when you have an error you need to fix, uh, a tool like that is really helpful because it's probably not in the code you wrote. It's like right. in the code. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right, right. Person that wrote that code probably, you know, may well not even work at the company anymore. Um, and, um, you know, yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, it's, it's an idea. I think, you know, it's an idea whose time has come. Um, and you're right. We're not the only, uh, uh, we're not the only people to be doing this. So I think, you know, we did kind of pioneer it, but yeah, Microsoft has something for Windows platform, DTD. There's a thing out there called RR for record and replay, which is, uh, that's another thing that runs on Linux like we do, it's open source. Um, so you can just use it. So I always encourage everybody, right? If you're not using RR, uh, if you're not even tried RR, go try that, right? That's a good place to start. All of our customers find that for one reason or another, RR doesn't work for them, right? Um, so it's like, going to be scalability issues. It can be, you know, sort of complexity issues. If they're, I mean, I don't know, like they're using DBTK or asynchronous IO in some way or shared memory or, you know, many, many processes or collaborating or, you know, they need to run a multi-tenant cloud. Like there's a, there's a bunch of places that, um, you know, the scale and environments where RR won't work. And then that's, you know, all of our customers, that's where kind of our customers um uh but rr is a, is a great place to start that's true that's that's a great tool which is on the linux easily accessible yeah exactly it's again it's a bit like i said with but my valgrind experience right you can see most of the packages so now you can just go sudo apt install rr and then you can you know record and use this thing and get, get a sense for it um and uh you know yeah pretty much you know it, it you know it's very easy to use, you know, so same for us, like you don't have to, you don't have to recompile your code. You don't have to, you know, do anything special, like, or, you know, install, you know, special kernel modules or anything. It, it, yeah, like basically it just works. Yeah, and if folks are interested about Undo, they can reach out to you, but also if you're coming to the conference in Berlin, you have uh, actually a booth and people can talk to yeah. Uh, you. Exactly. And... Yeah, exactly, so we'll be there. Um, I'll be there at least one of the days and some other folks will be there on the, on the undo booth at the, at the conference. Yeah. And yeah, we find, you know, we find meeting C++ just a great way to, you know, meet, uh, you know, get to talk to people. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, we, we're, we're there ultimately to find customers, but, uh, you know, it, sometimes it's directly finding customers, but often it's just, you know, meeting people and talking to people and, you know, being yeah. part of that community. Any connections. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I'm looking really forward to see you all again in Berlin. Just a few, I think it's like 35 days now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to it too. Yeah. So um, I know running a company makes one always a busy person. So I know you need to kind of, you know, um, go to your next meeting soon. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I do, I do. Um, thank you for coming and speaking with us. Yeah, it's good, and I apologize for starting a little late. It's been, it's just yeah, one of those days. But uh, yeah, always good to connect, Jens, and uh, look forward to seeing you in person in thirty-four days' time. All right, going cool. forward. Okay, see you. Bye.